Well, cool. Well, we're going to dig into the next section, which is knowing God through his word. So how do you know God? And we believe that that is through his word. Um, so we're going to, to do this, we're going to look to his word appropriately. Uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Psalm 19. And then I'd love to break this up into sections and get a couple of readers, if we can. Uh, would someone read verses uh, 1 through 4? Someone want to claim that? And then we'll, you got that one. And then could someone read, uh, actually, sorry, make that 1 through 6. You read 1 through 6. If someone wants to grab 7 through 11, yes, sir. And then 12 through 14. Got it? Awesome. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Sorry, Psalm, did I tell you the wrong one? Psalm 19. Yeah. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The session of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are right and good in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and right in the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and great forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is the excellent one, and two commandments is a great reward. Who perceives the things which are sin? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sin. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless in the presence of Blake and rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Let's, let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for just the privilege that it is that we get to know you. God, we thank you that you have made yourself known, that you want to be known, that you have commanded us to know you. Lord, we thank you for your holy, inerrant word that you've preserved through us for us. God, we pray that um, as we press in this morning, that you will reveal um, knowledge to us about you and knowledge about how to know you better, how to love you better, how to serve you better, and how to draw all of our confidence and identity in who you are and not in who we say we are or uh, who the world says that we are. God, we pray that you bless this time of study in Jesus' name. Amen. So how do you get to know others? How do you get to know anyone? You have to spending time, spending time with them by listening, right? Um, I saw an interview or heard an interview on NPR. I'm trying to remember this guy's name. Uh, the C Google CEO. You want to know his name? I'm going to look it up. Sundar Pichai. Yeah. So I heard an interview on NPR with Sundar Pichai. And... Uh, it was kind of like a casual tongue-in-cheek interview, and the guy asked him, so be honest with me, how much does Google know about us? And he said, as much as you'll tell us. <laughs> and I thought that was an honest answer, right? And it also freaked me out a little bit because I thought, like, how much am I telling Google? Like, I don't, I'm not keeping track of that. Um, but yeah, Google knows as much as you will tell them, as much as you will allow them to know. Um, and most of it you probably tell them without knowing you're telling them. Um, and on the inverse of that, uh, in our relationship with God and understanding how much we know God, like we'll, he's already told us everything, everything we need to know about God, he has laid out for us in his word. 
And so then how much do we know about God is how much we're willing to learn, how much we press in to know. Um, so let's start looking at Psalm 19. This is a great passage for understanding how Scripture and creation in general, but Scripture specifically, reveals who God is and how to know him. Uh, have you heard, has anyone heard the term general revelation? So that's kind of what is being painted, the pa- picture that's being painted at the beginning of Psalm 19 is this idea of general revelation, the idea that the heavens, creation, everything that God has made is declaring who God is, um, that it is speaking about him just in the way that creation continues. Um, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the expanse proclaims the works of his hands. I mean, we see this even in, uh, even in secular culture, in secular filmmaking, you know, there's a lot of like, those like awe-inspiring moments where they're just like standing at the Grand Canyon and they're just like overcome and they don't say like, oh, this is clearly Yahweh that made this, but they'll say like, like, there has to be something more. You know, there's that, there's that constant tension, even in unbelievers, where parts of creation proclaim God so boldly that they feel that connection with divinity in some way, even if they can't articulate what it is. That's general revelation. Um, you know, I, I love going to uh, the Science Center. We had a great Science Center in St. Louis where I grew up, and they did all this cool, like, astrophysics stuff, and I didn't understand any of it. But what I did get was that it's just so incredible how God has put the universe in motion, how he has uh, suspended everything in perfect placement for us to discover, and we keep spying further and further into it, and we can't find the end of it yet. And there is a sense of awe and wonder in... uh, in NASA, in any organization that studies that. And again, it's not necessarily pointing them directly to Christ, but it is, uh, you, have to, you have to fight to be an atheist and, and study the expanses. You have to really make that a commitment um, because it's so boldly declaring that this cannot be an accident, this can't be just happenstance, like, a creator has put this into motion. So that's what David's talking about here. Um, so looking at verses 1 through 6, uh, how do the heavens declare the glory of, his, of the Lord? Uh, continually, it says day after day they pour out speech. Um, verse 3, without words. So again, it's not specifics, right? It's The heavens aren't doing this uh, in a way that will tell you, like, it's not, it's not a giant sign painted on the sky. Um, it says, there is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Um, but it's also uh, for all, it's for everyone. Verse 4, the message has gone out to the whole earth and their, worlds to the in, and their words to the ends of the world. There's this... Uh, this like question that comes up a lot about like the man on the island. How does the man on the island know God if no one gets to him? How does he get saved if no one gets there? Does he automatically go to heaven because no one's told him? How does that work? So the, it's this kind of false premise because the man on the island, so let's say he's had no contact with a believer, he's just been isolated, but... Uh, what Scripture is telling us is that the heavens declare enough so that he knows there is a God. He knows there is more uh, beyond just himself. Um, But if we look real quick at Romans 1, uh, Romans 1, verse 18, it says, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness, again, revealed from heaven, of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have clearly seen, have, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood 
through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So this man on the island is kind of a false question because general revelation is there, and general revelation is enough to condemn you. It's enough to make you aware enough of God to condemn you of your sins, but it's not special revelation. It's not uh, the gospel being proclaimed to your face, so it's not enough to save you. So that's why if, if the man on the island premise was true, we would just immediately cancel all mission trips, right? I mean, like, stop telling them about the gospel. If they don't know, then they just go to heaven. Like, it's, but that's not how it works. Um, that's why we do take missions very seriously. It's why we get to the IMB and everything else. It's because we believe that even in remote tribes, creation has declared that there is a God. And then it's our job, not just Western Americans, but it's Christians' job around the world uh, to meet them and proclaim the gospel of Christ. That's what the Great Commission exists for. Jesus wouldn't have sent us out on that mission if it was just going to, like, ruin their chances. You know, if, if they had, like, a get-out-of-hell-free card and speaking to them took that away, then we would not say anything. So uh, this is just kind of the tricky thing we have to think through a general revelation, that it's, it's there, it's real, it proclaims that there is a God, and then special revelation is the person-to-person this is who Jesus is. This is what he's done for me, what he's done for you, and proclaiming faith in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the more that we... That's why Christians shouldn't be afraid of the sciences. Like, it's not in contradiction with what we believe. The more we press in to how we can learn about the way things work, the more we see the majesty of God in his creation. Um, <clears throat> so then he gives us an example in verse 5. He uses the sun as an example. Um, it is like the bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. So he sets the sun up as this kind of like dignitary or this king rising up out of the, out of the sky. And there's excellence in his form. There's swiftness in the, in the path. And that goes back to what you're saying. Like if the sun was just like one degree off, like life ceases on earth. Like we just can't, it cannot be sustained. So there's this massive complexity and speed and everything, but it's all being orchestrated by our creator. Uh, so it's even in, you know, if all you can ever see is the sun rising and setting, you can see the majesty of God. You can see that there is a creator. So we see God's glory displayed in what he's made. Uh, this is This is an important part for me just as a, as a creative person, as a creator, uh, it's important for me to remember that the purpose of creativity, even in my personal life, whatever things I can create and whatever you create, whether you're a musician or a painter or a sculptor or poet, whatever it might be, that our creativity is, we, we work as sub-creators under the larger creator. We can't create anything that has not been created by God. Does that make sense? Like even like the instrument I play, like God made the wood and the steel that bring it together. He made the mind that could, that could think to put them together in that order to make melody. He made my mind that would play melodies. Like everything that we do uh, points to a creator. That's why Christians in the arts is so important. And if you look back in church history, um, you know, the Dark Ages weren't great. They were dark for a reason. But <laughs> one good thing that we see in there is that Christians really took up the arts. They took it really seriously um, because they understood God as creator. They understood that what we make with our hands, what we sing with our lips, that's pointing to God. Um, any act of creation that we do, even if it's baking cookies, whatever it is, like it's all pointing to God. And so as Christians, we can take those things and we can worship with them in that process. We can worship through the things that we create, the things that we uh, dream up and, and write down, whatever it might be. Um, Harold Best has a really great book on this uh, called Unceasing Worship. If you just want like a random philosophical thing on Christians in the arts, there's my stamp. That's my recommendation. Harold Best, Unceasing Worship. Um, but he talks about kind of this 
general revelation, how it plays into the lives of, of the secular world. And uh, he talks a lot about liturgy and you know, going through repetitive motions in worship and how everyone is a worshiper. Every single human being is a worshiper because since we are made in the image of God, we are made to be worshipers. We don't all worship God. Um, most of us don't. We, you know, those gathered in the church do, which is a great privilege. Um, but he even talks about, like, if you go to the mall, especially, like, around the holiday season, you can, you can almost, like, identify the different parts of the liturgy of going to the mall. If the mall is your church, you come in, uh, you go to, like, the relics, you hand over your offering to the priests, you receive a blessing. Like he said, it's, it's all just worship in different ways through uh, different means of things that we're trying to find satisfaction in. We're trying to fill this gap that we have um, because things like general revelation, because the heavens declare, there's a hole in all of us, and there's this longing for an understanding. Um, one of the things that saddens me, but is a continual affirmation of the gospel um, I watch a lot of music documentaries. I love just, you know, following bands or albums that were made or studios, whatever. Every single musician that I love and follow, like, there's always, like, the point in the interview where, like, the music gets a little somber and it doesn't matter who they are, how long of a career they had, and they just talk about how, like, I still just feel like there's this, like, hole in my life and, you know, I've got all of this stuff, and, like, it's still not satisfying me. Um, you know, Paul McCartney talks about that, for crying out loud, like, the greatest band ever, a great solo career, and still, like, at 66 or whatever he is, he's just like, man, there's just still, there's something more. I haven't found it yet. Um, that is... That is just a human being being honest about what every human being feels from birth to death without Christ. Um, the heavens have declared it, and our bodies, our emotions are responding to it constantly, that there is something more. And so whenever we get scared to evangelize, whenever Satan lies to us and tells us, like, they don't want to hear you say that, that's awkward, like, that may be true, they may not want to hear it, but deep down they know they need to hear it. They, every single person you're talking to needs to have that void filled with the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to be honest with yourself and, and deny some kind of divinity. Um, okay, so let's move on. So that's general revelation. It's kind of a complicated thing, but... Uh, Looking at, uh, let's look at verses 7 through 9. So knowing God through the law of the Lord. It says, The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The commandment of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure enduring forever. Um, so the law of the Lord, when it talks about that, we got to think that that's not just the Old Testament commands. It's broader than that. So when you read law of the Lord, think scripture as a whole. That's what David's referring to. Obviously, David didn't have the New Testament when he wrote this, but he's talking about the word of God. Um, and that's what we have in this, you know, as we are blessed to be on the other side of this and have the full picture. Uh, so we see that it revives the soul. Um, the word brings life. You know, there is no spiritual life outside of the Bible. Um, we cannot maintain a spiritual consistency, a spiritual, a healthy spiritual life if we're not in God's word, um, because uh, then we're kind of becoming the opposite of Proverbs 3, where it says, like, lean not on your own understanding, right? If you are living a spiritual life apart from God's word, that's exactly what you're doing. You're leaning on your own understanding. Um, his testimony is sure, right? Like we can trust what God says in his word. 
Um, that's super important for us to let that sink in. Um, that's something that we can say with our lips a thousand times, but until we die, we'll probably only be like 98% there that we believe his testimony is sure because uh, the implications of that are too strong, right? Like if we read every single thing in the word of God, like, yes, that's true. We, we say that, but then in acting it out is much more difficult. Um, but God's testimony is true. The law is, the word of the Lord is true. We believe it is uh, inerrant, without error. We believe that it has been preserved through, uh, and I think he just like made like a really harsh judgment. It sounds like a court next door. Like, I don't know what's going on over there. Um, but uh, we, can, we can base our lives on what we find in the word of God. Um, let's see, verse 8. His commands and precepts are pure and right, making the heart glad. Uh, so there, it's not a drudgery. It's, it's actual joy to study the Word of God. Um, it brings us good, not harm. And uh, it says it lightens up the eyes. My translation says makes the eyes light up. Do you ever have like that fogginess in your heart, in your mind, like when you've been away from the Word of God for a while? Have you, have you experienced that? Like that's, uh, it's so frustrating that like we still struggle, I still struggle with that. And it's every time I like actually sit down then and like study the Word of God and feel that fog lift, that's what David's talking about here. It lightens the eyes, it lifts the fog. Um, that never gets old for me. It, it, I get tired of my own failures that bring me to that point, but I am, I am so relieved every time I can get into the Word of God and see that fog lift and see, you know, that I'm welcomed back to the table. Um, Christ is always welcoming. He's always there with His Word. And uh, there's never a moment where I've sat down and not been satisfied. And I think that's what the, the reason that we step away from Scripture or we step away from our, anything in, the, in our faith, whether it's quiet time, studying God's Word, prayer life, whatever it is, it's because we're believing a lie, right, about that situation. So Satan would love to lie to you and tell you, like, okay, whatever sin you fell back into this week, um, you, can't, you can't just, like, sit down and read your Bible now after what you've done, right? Or uh, you're too busy, you just don't have time this week, God still loves you. Like, there's enough truth in every lie that Satan tells you to, to convince you, like, okay, maybe I don't have to sit down with Scripture this week. Um, but carving out that time, fighting against that, is so important. It's so vital for our spiritual health. So yeah, so looking back at these verses, underlying these four words, there was knowing God through his word brings life, joy, wisdom, and clarity. I was struck by that just because I thought uh, about the alternatives, like this, how the secular world offers us the exact opposite of that. Um, death, sorrow, foolishness, and uncertainty. It was, if you look under the hood of everything that propels um, the secular world, it's propelled by death, it's propelled by sorrow, foolishness, and uncertainty. Um, we see the culture of death in entertainment, in, uh, in the abortion industry. We see it in uh, the, our lack of concern for um, other image bearers that are killed. And all of that is contrary to God's word. Um, governments don't know how to respond to uh, disaster. They don't know how to respond to um, truly heartbreaking things apart from the word of God. And that's why it's so important that we are on 
uh, those front lines serving and ministering to people as best as we can. Um, because a lost world has no answer for sorrow. They have no answer for death. Uh, they have no answer for foolishness. They have no answer for uncertainty. And uh, the more that we press in to know God, the more that we understand who God is uh, through his word, the more we have in our arsenal to help people in those situations. Um, we had the high school that I went to. I grew up in a really small town, about 3,000 people. There was, I think, 62 people in my graduating class. And in this tiny high school, I lost four friends in three different deadly car accidents. In this tiny school. So you can imagine, like, in a class of 62, like, you know every single person. You can imagine, like, the ripples that that sends through a community when something like that happens. And I was a Christian at the time when this took place, but um, seeing a secular world, a, a lost community, scramble and grasp for answers in those moments uh, was heartbreaking. It was terrifying to see what they thought would be answers for those situations. You know, like, they always make counselors available. And I, I do genuinely appreciate, like, that effort. I, they're doing the best they can because they don't know the Lord. Um, but I sat with morning friends in some of those counseling sessions just to be there with them. And gosh, like, the advice that suffering people are getting from a lost world gets them nowhere. It's just... It's just more sorrow chasing sorrow. Um, there's, there's no depth to it. There's nothing that can save them. There's nothing that can put things in a broader perspective. Um, so that's another reason why we have to take this seriously, why we have to know God um, so that we're fluent in the things of God and able to speak into those situations because the, the world just has nothing to offer. They can't do it. And um, we are not short on tragedies right now. There's plenty around. Uh, and I'm so thankful for the SBC and, and like NAM and Send Relief that we partner with. Um, but it doesn't even have to be on that grand of a scale. You know, there's there's uh, someone in your workplace who has someone who's dying of cancer or um, battling with Alzheimer's or, you know, there's sorrow all around us. And uh, if, if general revelation has already, before the sorrow came, put that hole in their heart where they see they need something and then add tragedy on top of that, that's, that's, uh, that's a harvest that we need to be in. They are ripe for to harvest, and we need to be speaking the gospel into those situations. Um, so that's one of the reasons why this is so important. What do you think right now is speaking the most into your identity? Who, is, who or what is telling you the most about who you are? Is it culture as a whole? Is it TV? Is it social media? Like where? You don't have to answer out loud, but I just want you to like wrestle in your mind. Like If you're being honest with yourself, like where... Do you feel that the most information is coming at you about who you are? Um, I'm a millennial. I'm an elder millennial, like right at the cusp of uh, what was before millennials, Gen X? Is that right? It? Yeah, yeah. I'm like right between Gen X and millennial, depending on which timeline. So like young enough to be addicted to a smartphone, but old enough to love grunge. Like that's, that's, <laughs> that's my window. <laughs> Um, so as a millennial, I have found myself finding a lot of my, or again, I don't want to say I'm finding my identity, but receiving information about who I am through social media. Um, especially as, you know, as a songwriter, I'm trying to have like some kind of presence online so people can find my music and, and there's a, just a lot that social media will tell you about who you are. You know, if you don't have enough followers, there's probably something wrong with either you or your art. Um, if this promotion didn't work as well as you thought it would, what is that telling you about who you are? Um, and I think that gets exponentially worse the younger that you get. Like, we, I work with the students on Sunday nights as well, and 
man, I'm, I'm so glad Instagram didn't exist when I was in middle school. Like, I can't imagine how my brain would have even processed that. Uh, I just would have been like an anxious wreck the entire time. Um, but our kids are being fed so much information about who they are through social media, through culture, um, even through music. Um, you know, young men are being told what kind of uh, what kind of man they're supposed to grow up to be through art. Uh, young women are being told what kind of object they are supposed to be for that man as they get older. Um, the whole culture around that is sending information about who we are. One of the reasons why it's so important to know God through His Word is because. If we know God, then we'll see his image in the image bearers around us um, and in ourselves. So we have to believe that we are who God says that we are. We actually didn't plan it this way, but we're singing a Hillsong song this morning called Who You Say I Am. Um, And that's basically what the song is about, that we are who God says we are. We're not who anyone else says that we are. Um, That our standing that our only standing that matters is with him alone. <coughs> and uh, we have to train ourselves to see the image of God in others around us. Um, the lack of empathy and compassion that exists in the world is because they don't know God, so they don't see his image in the people around them. It's hard to hate someone when you see the image of God in them. It's really hard. If you understand who God is, if you really understand his image, and you can see that reflected even in your worst enemy, um, it's hard. You know, we live in a divided time. I feel like every Sunday school teacher says that like every Sunday morning. We live in a divided time. Like, it's just kind of like, it's just on our minds constantly. Um, but even in every single circle is being divided right now. Even Southern Baptist life is divided. Um, and whoever your online spat is with is with another image bearer. Um, I think if we were shaped by that compassion, if we were shaped by that image, seeing that in other people, it would flip the way that we interact sometimes. All right, so real quick, we got just a few minutes left. Um, let's look at uh, verse 9. <clears throat> The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. The fear of the Lord never spoils in the heart of the believer. Um, We can do a lot to press it down. We can resist it. Um, But uh, if it was ever truly there, it will never truly leave. Excuse me, there's... um, There's a lot of uh, pastors and musicians who, former Christian musicians, who have made headlines because they're walking away from the faith. Um, The sad reality is no one's ever walked away from the faith. They've just continued to walk in their faithlessness, and now they're more honest about it. Um, The fear of the Lord is a gift of the Holy Spirit through salvation and it will never leave. Um, that's why I, I plead for them. I pray for them. I pray that it's just a season and that, that fear of the Lord will take over and call them back. Um, that I pray that they've just been able to fight it and resist it and press it down. Um, and I pray that for family members. You know, We all have family members who um, at one time were professing Christians, but now have either walked away or they're not in church or wh- whatever it may be. Um, Pray that the fear of the Lord that you saw in them was real and that it will bring them back Uh, because it never spoils it. You cannot cannot reject it from your heart if it was given to you. Um, So some application. We should receive the word with joy. Verse 10, they are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, like how much do we often, how often do we desire the word of God more than gold? (laughs) Um, 
How often do we have a sweet tooth for the instruction of Christ? Uh, like, I think if you look at, like, the screen time on your phone, like, that annual report, I just got mine this morning when I was preparing this lesson. I'm not going to tell you what it was. Um, but I think that tells us a little bit, you know, unless, like, all six hours of your screen time were spent on, like, the Bible app, which I, I don't believe. <laughs> but it, where we spend our time um, is a big reflection of what we love, what we value, and... Um, God's word is, is true in that it, it is sweeter than the honeycomb. It's just that we're believing lies that it's not. Um, and, you know, there's usually not a whole lot of conviction that comes with Facebook, right? There's not a whole lot of, like, stepping on our toes and, and correction. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's easy to resist the word of God is because it's so much easier just to go to something mindless that won't sharpen us and steer us, um, but then we're also dull and misguided. So it's, <laughs> it's hard to strike that balance. It's hard to find ourselves in a place where we do desire the Scripture more than gold. And so I think it's, if you look at, um, if any of you read any of the prayers in the Valley of Vision, the Puritan prayers, highly recommend you check it out. You can get like a six dollar paperback on Amazon, but it's a collection of written out prayers um, by Puritans, and there's a lot in there where the, the Puritans were just more honest in their prayers than we typically are, and so there's a lot in there of like, God, please give me the grace to desire your word. Give me the grace to desire it more than gold, to really taste it as sweeter than honey. And that's okay. That, when we pray that prayer, we're not, it's not self-condemning. We're not like throwing ourselves under the bus. It's good to be honest with ourselves and with God that like, you know what? I don't want to read the Bible today. Like, I just don't. I'm not feeling it. I just got Disney Plus and it's like really great. <laughs> but like that's, that's real. That's real life. And it's okay to take that before the throne of God. When, when Paul says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence... Um, obviously the main point of that is we can do that because Christ has clothed us in his righteousness. But apart from salvation, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence because we serve a very loving, kind God who is slow to anger and quick to forgive. And he would much rather us come to him and say, God, I do not want to read your word today. Please help me want to read your word today. Um, just like the passage that says, Lord, uh, help my unbelief. Like, that's real. It's real that sometimes we just wake up and we don't believe actively. You know, we believe in the back of our minds, but not with our actions. Um, it's real that we don't have that desire uh, that is stronger than gold to seek the truth and wisdom of God through his word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Even if that means just taking one verse and just meditating on it. Um, you know, Scripture is rich enough that that works. Uh, that's, that's enough. Um, I, because I grew up with, in a pastor's home and surrounded by a lot of theologian friends of my dad, like I, f I kind of felt this like, insufficiency of like, man, I don't have like, books and books and books lining the shelves. I don't have... Uh, like, I don't sit down and, and just digest, like, an entire book of the Bible in one sitting. And, you know, thankfully, through the instruction of my dad, like, realizing, like, that's, that's not what he's doing either. Like, it's, you don't have to sit down and just take these huge bites out of Scripture to be fed by it. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but, like, even just taking, like, the small bites and really chewing on it for a long time... Um, is so helpful. All right, I think we're about out of time. I've got a few more things to cover, but we'll tackle this next week. Um, so we'll wrap up a little bit of Psalm 19 next week, and then we'll talk about um, the holiness of God. We're going to start getting into some of the actual attributes of God. Um, and again, all of that we will learn through his word. So the general premise is we, we need to know God. Uh, we can know God through his word. 
And then now we're going to start looking at those attributes next week and see what that actually looks like.